I am three years post-affair in my marriage and two and a half years into reconciling it. I am wrestling with the question of when do you throw in the towel and just say it's too far gone, progress isn't being made and we are just forever going to be stuck. What up, what up, what up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. So glad that you're joining us on what may be the greatest mental health and parenting and dating and child raising show ever. <laughs> may, maybe. So glad that you're with us. This is a show about real people going through real challenges um, in their life right now. And my promise is I'll sit with you and we will figure out what the best, the best next right step is. So if you want to be on the show, give me a buzz. 1-844-693-3291. 1-844-693-3291. Or go to johndeloney.com slash ask. A-S-K. Um, all right, guys. So two big news. Big news number one is don't forget pre-sale. My brand new book, Building a Non-Anxious Life, is now for pre-sale. We're giving away a billion, not a billion, a lot of cool pre-sale items and all that, which is all great and good. It makes such an important difference. If you pre-order the books, 20 bucks, go to johndeloney.com. It makes a huge difference across every metric if you will pre-order it. So you got people in your life. Um, it's about uh, the people in your life who are struggling with chronic stress, burnout, who are just anxious, 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 anxious. If you've listened to this show for a while, you know I just have a different take on anxiety and really the mental health issues in this country that we're facing, or globally, really. And this is just my treaties. This is the book that I'm going to put a stamp on and say, we got to do things different. What we're doing is not working. We got to do things different. And this is not just a philosophy book and it's not a nerdy science book. This is a clear path into building a non-anxious life and giving everybody in your house peace, man. And I'm just tired of watching people burn out. So go to johndeloney.com and check it out. Um, Man, thank you so much. I'm just grateful. All right, here's the second thing. So here's what happened last night, Kelly, Ben. Here's what happens. Here's the story. So um, there was a big rock concert in town last night, a big punk rock show. Turnstile and others were playing. And I was meeting two people here at the building, and um, one of them was George Camel and um, another buddy here in town, and we were going to drive to the show together. I was going to drive. So I live about 30 minutes out in the woods and we're going to meet at the Ramsey Solutions building, which is kind of a halfway point for everybody. So I'm getting ready to leave, getting ready to leave. Can't find my keys, can't find my keys. I call my wife who has taken my kids on a kayaking trip. And I said, hey, I need the keys. And she's like, well, they're, I don't have them. And then she dug around in her purse and she goes, oh gosh, I've got both keys. And I was like, oh, that's, okay, cool. I'll figure it out. So I hung up. We have an old farm truck out at our place. It's not great. But I, I was like, I'll drive the truck. Look around, look around, go through everything, go through everything, go through everything. I call her and say, where are the truck keys? She has both sets of truck keys in her purse too. We have three cars, two cars and a farm truck. She has all keys in her purse. So I hung up and I immediately called George Camel, who is headed towards the building. Now, if you have, in, in, in where we live in, in Nashville, if you build new construction, um, you have to include X number of electric vehicle charging stations. And so George was just going to bring his, his Tesla over here and plug it in. Well, I caught him on the road and he came to, I said, hey, I need you to come get me. I know I was supposed to drive, but I can't. I need you to come get me. He goes, cool. He heads my way. And as he gets onto the highway, he punches in my address and realizes he's going to end the trip three miles short from a charge. He doesn't have enough battery, but it's too late. And so he's like, surely there's like a five mile buffer or something. There wasn't. So... Then the car runs out of battery on the side of the highway. I mean, right as we exit the highway. And it was a climate change denier, um, conservative photographer's fantasy photo to see George Camel steering a Prius while I pushed it down the side of the road. It was incredible. I was just, a uh, Tesla, sorry, Tesla. Yeah, worse than a Prius. I was pushing a Tesla. And I kept calling to the heavens, hoping, hoping that Elon would hear me. He didn't. For all you conspiracy theorists out there, Starlink's not listening because I just pushed the Tesla down the highway. And then our last resort was our buddy had a purple Kia Rio that I'm fairly certain he started with a rope. 
And I don't know how three grown men fit in that car. But we drove downtown to the punk rock show, and it was incredible. That's all I have to say about that. I will never push a Tesla again as long as I live. And I was about to make the move. I think I was about to be a, an electric car guy. Did you push it all three miles? No, goodness, no. Those, those batteries, are, the car was so heavy. I've pushed trucks that weren't that heavy. And I don't want to, like, throw shade, but George isn't, like, super ripped. He wasn't contributing a lot. Sure. He was mostly steering and, and videoing me as I, as I pushed, <laughs> like a good millennial guy would. Anyway, we survived. I got home at 3 a.m., and here we are. Let's go out to Little Rock, Arkansas and talk to Scott. Scott, bail me out, dude. Dr. John, it's a pleasure. Thanks for taking my call. You got it, brother. What's up, man? So I am three years uh, post-affair in my marriage and two and a half years into reconciling it. I was the one who had the affair. Um, I was the one who initiated the reconciliation. I, I ended it with the the other person and told my wife that I was committed to us and committed to doing the work to reconcile the marriage and rebuild it into what it was supposed to be. And, uh, you know, we've had our ups and downs. And at this point, two and a half years in, I am wrestling with the question of when do you throw in the towel and just say it's, it's too far gone. Um, progress isn't being made and we are just forever going to be stuck. Number one, thanks for laying it out that way. And this isn't going to pay your rent, but what you're experiencing is one of the most common conversations I have with folks post, um, post affair, which is that sense of feeling of, of loyalty and guilt. And I remember why I love you. And then one to two to three years in, that sense of, oh, and now I remember why I stepped out. Or I remember how the, 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 the environment was, was created and I got on a track that I made some stupid decisions. Um, when you say you're ready to throw in the towel, what, what, what's not there that you think should be there or you would like to be there? Well, I, I, I mean, what I need is I need deep emotional connection and vulnerability and intimacy with my wife. What does that mean? I, I, Those are buzzwords that are like, like stitch on a pillow sure. words. What does that mean? Give me sure. some, give me mean, some I, actions. Well, I need her to be able to tell me what, what she is feeling. I need her to be able to tell me how she's feeling and communicate to me when I am doing something that is making her feel less than making her feel unsafe. And I need to be able to do the same and feel like, uh, feel like I'm not being punished and I need for her to come to me confidently. And, uh, and ultimately this, this part is my responsibility, but I, I need to make sure that I foster an environment where she doesn't feel like I'm punishing her. Are you doing that? I think I am. Um, I, I'm certainly, I'm certainly doing my best. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I will readily admit if you can name the stupid things that the, the, the wayward spouse has done post affair to try to justify, rationalize, whatever. I, I mean, I've probably done it. It's just, and at the same time, I have been immediately, I, I started going to therapy and I, I've had a regular, I've had regular appointments with a therapist trying to sort through my own dysfunction. I, I mean, no, I'm not perfect. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, even just recently, I caught myself in the middle of an argument where she, she did express something to me and I, I, it was a few minutes in and I thought, you know what? I'm actually, I've completely turned this around and I've made this about me. And, uh, I, I called myself out at that point and said, I, I don't want to do that to you. And it's, it's frustrating to me because I don't feel like I get anywhere with it. 
even when I do call myself out, it, it, it's met with a response of, you know, see, this is, this is, this, this is how it is. This is how it's always been. And but, I'm just tired. I got that. But can two things be true at the same time? Yes, sir. Can it really have been how it's been all this time? And you're both exhausted at how you respond to things? 100%. And that's a tricky, that's a tricky place to find yourself, right? Because that's, I mean, that's, that's the act of throwing in the towel. Like, yes, I keep, I keep falling back into old patterns. I keep falling back into old situations and your body keeps telling you you're not safe again and again and again. And dude, I'm just so tired of trying. I get that. Have you told her directly what you just told me? Yes, I have. What does she say to that? Um... Well, I mean, she puts up her guard because in her mind, she's, she says, you're taking the easy way out by leaving divorce as an option on the table. And it, it kind of just stops there. Well, have you put divorce on the table? Yeah, it, it I mean, I have. It, well, how, is she, I, how is she I'm, supposed to anchor into that, dude? No, that's a good question. I mean, like, I, like, I, so, so you, like, you blew this thing up, knowing there's always two sides to a story. And I'm not saying there was an environment. I, I'm, I'm sure there was participation on both sides. I'm not one of those guys, okay? But you stepped out. It happened. Yep. Um, and then I'm assuming there was some significant fracture, and you came back and said, "I'm, I'm back in. I want in." And she said, "Cool." And then somewhere along the way in the last two and a half years, you put divorce back on the table. It's just hard to, it's hard to anchor back into. And here's the, like, I keep having this sense. Tell me if I'm crazy. It almost feels like you're throwing the towel in on Scott. Um, I mean, I, I, I want to listen to that a little bit more. I, I don't think that I am. I, I actually am pretty amazed at a lot of the personal progress that I've made in the past few years. I Is she not making any? Mm, it's it's hard to say. I I, I mean it, this is this is hard to say because what I did to her is not her fault. Okay. She didn't ask for it and I cannot cannot imagine being on the receiving end of what I did to her. Um have you forgiven you man? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Okay. Did she forgive you? She says she has. Um, you don't think so? No, because it, 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 just things from the past, even stuff that predates my affair, just it constantly comes up in arguments. And I'll, constantly, I'll say that's not cool. It's like once you're back on the, hey, we're on this track, that's not cool to bring up two and five and seven and eight-year-old things. That's hard. I, I constantly find out that she still will tell people randomly about about what I did. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand that that's her story too. She's entitled to do that. Um, yeah, but there's some but sanctity really things. Yeah, there's some sanctity, sanctity things that are, are private and there's some... Yeah, there's there's telling your story, but then there's also spreading somebody else's shame. That's that's tough. So tell me, take me back, take me back to your affair, dude. Like, what was it yeah. about that that happened? Like, what did that give you? <laughs> it, it honestly, it was it was an ego thing. It was me indulging my ego, and. Yeah, but your the, ego, the your ego, your ego needed something. What was it? What did it get? It needed connection. Okay. It needed that intimacy. There was there was just a relational hole. Um, I needed to feel heard. I needed to feel I had influence. I needed to feel like my words mattered. And I just I, I found it in all the wrong places, temporarily.
And when your wife has heard that, does she agree with you or does she say, no, that's not true at all? I was listening to you. Your words didn't matter in this house. <laughs> she, she, she agrees to it. And then I, I usually get met with a, you have to understand my personality just to align myself to that. That's, that's the response that I get. Yeah. And I don't buy that. That's not true. It's it's a it's a, a that's a choice, right? So I, I get that frustration that you're experiencing. That's tough. Or there's something about the vulnerability when you say I need this, and, and the person you love says I'm not, I can't do that. Yeah, that's a really tough spot to be in. I mean, you know, just a good example. Um, about ten years ago, I had a pretty uh, significant event happen that it was over professional and personal lines and it had to do with my family. It had to do with work. It had to do, I mean, it was not a personal failure on my part. Um, and I remember just confiding in her, telling her kind of what happened. Part of it involved me feeling like I did not protect my family like I should have. And I remember just kind of being met with a blank look on that. And at that point I just knew, I said, you know, told me, she is not, she's not going to be here for me when I need her. And I carried that with me. Is that, was it real? It was very real. I still deal with it to this day. Have you talked to her about that, that moment? Yeah, I have. What'd she say? And she, she says that she didn't realize how badly it was hurting me at the time. And that, 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 um, what's the right word? That acknowledgement is huge, but then the actions that come after speak volumes, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming there's, it's like, man, I'm so sorry I hurt you. And then the behavior of hurting you is just continued. Yeah, and I mean, it wasn't a conscious act of hurting me. It was, it felt like indifference almost. Yeah. And it's sounding more and more, um, I was really captivated by some research done by by Esther Perel, one of the great relationship um, minds of our time, who said that most people step out for one reason, and it can be distilled onto one word, and it's alive. I felt people say heard, I excited, desired, wanted, but I finally felt alive again. And if you feel like you're with somebody that is just indifferent to struggling, or I know how tough it is as a grown man to overcome all of your social conditioning, to shut your mouth and just plot ahead, to, to look at somebody that you care about and love and say, Hey, I really think I botched this up and I'm so sorry. And they just look at you like, I don't really care. Like, that's brutal, man. It's brutal. Yeah. I, I don't think that's a pass to go do what you did. And I don't think you, you would suggest that's, that that was a pass. But Not at all. here's what I think. I mean, you're two and a half years in. I think there's a moment when you've heard me say this analogy, but I think y'all are here. Um, where you have to turn all the lights on, turn the music off and go somewhere for a half day and have a grown up conversation about, are we going to keep doing this or not? And I think in these moments, um, there has to be some crystal, crystal clarity on both sides. I need you to not bring up any things from anything from the past. If I say, and I'm, I'm going to tell you this, my wife has been this kind of clear with me and it has been a lifesaver for me. Admittedly, I was craving ways to connect, but she would say, if I say this, please don't respond with the following two or three things. Because she knew I was trying to love her the best I could, and those two or three things shut her down. And so she was that clear with me. Or y'all go sit down and have a grown-up conversation and say, are we going to continue this? And if we're not, we have to be grown-ups about how we separate this thing out. But I think you're at a place where you're done wishing that things are going to be different. You're tired of tripping as you're practicing living in a new way. And then the whole past gets rolled back out on you. 
Like, it just sounds like a big mess. It is. Has she been in couples counseling with you? We've done two intensives. We did couples counseling for a little bit, and uh, we're not presently seeing a couples therapist. I'm I'm seeing an individual therapist, and she herself is not seeing anybody right now. Okay. What is your counselor telling you to do? My counselor is, he's not telling me to do anything. Um, he's, he listens. Um, the biggest thing that he has been teaching me it, is to avoid taking offense easily, because when I do, it takes the focus off of what somebody's coming at me with and it puts it on myself. And so that's actually been a huge focus of the work that I've been trying to do. Sure. And is he right? Do you, when, if your wife gives you the wrong look, it sounds like you hold her to that look for years. I think I do. Yeah. Or if she doesn't respond in exactly the right way, there's not a, you don't have a, like a, a grace period. It's just all or nothing. I'm, I wouldn't say that I have a fiery temper. I don't. I don't. No, 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 no. I don't think. I don't think it's that. It's not all or nothing. It is on or off. I never yell in my house, but there are moments when if my wife says something the wrong way. I I'm out. Bye. And I'm not leaving, but I have disassociated, and now she can see it on me. <laughs> right. I, I I wear my emotions on my sleeve. Okay. So your wife can can say the wrong thing and she can see it all over you. Yeah, I think she can. Yeah. And she also has probably learned by this point, there's no coming back. Yeah, I think she probably has. And I guess one of the things I want to just point out is that I, I want direct talk. I want to know when I'm doing something right. And I want to know when I'm doing something wrong. Absolutely. What does she say? She won't I'm, give you that? No, she won't. I, I told her the other day that I feel like I've been put in a dark room and just been told to find my way to the door. That's a fair analogy. I like that. And, and the only way that I can find that I'm going the wrong way is when I stub my toe on the furniture. Very fair. Why won't she tell you what she needs? I think it's because she, she says she doesn't feel safe. And there's credibility to that. Yeah. At some point, she's going to have to be an adult and say the safety is not going to come back in this marriage. Like I'm not going to ever feel safe again or give you some direction on here's the things I'm going to need you to do so that I feel safe. I applaud you, man, for coming back. And I applaud you for saying, for doing all the work you've done on yourself. I really do. And I applaud you for saying, I need these things. And that's the other side to being vulnerable is that somebody you love can say, sorry, man, I can't do that. Or I'm not going to do that. Or that's just the way I am. And for everybody listening, I don't buy that in a marriage context at all. I don't buy that hook, line, and sinker for anybody. Well, that's just me. I don't buy it. It's easy. But I can tell from personal experience, there were some moments when Here's how I just, in, uh, here's how I interact with the world. And if I continue to interact with the world like this, my marriage will be over. And so I had to choose that over me, which is a whole act of getting married in the first place. But brother Scott, I, here's the deal. You've put in a ton of work, man. You put in a ton of work. And when you said I'm back in and she said we're back in, y'all were back in. But it sounds like there's differing degrees on who's working on what and how, who's working on who and when and all that mess, man. And so at this point, I think it's a, we need to go out and we need to put it on the table. Do you want to stay married to me? If you want to stay married to me, here's what I need. And I really want to stay married to you. And please tell me what you need to feel safe. Tell me what you need to do these things. And if you can't tell me, then behavior is a language. Then you don't want to, this thing to work. You just want me to be the bad guy. Or you are, are just hurt in a way that I'm never going to be able to overcome it. And so be it. I did step out on you. I did, I did cheat on you. Whatever you want to say, I did cheat on you. And if we can't come back, we can't come back. But I need us to both be adults and call it. But I think that's where we are. I think the intensives are cool when you have 
therapists that moderate that. I think y'all are past that at this point. I think you're at a, let's just go be adults. And let's just promise not to shut down on each other. Let's just promise to write down things that we need. Let's promise to have this really challenging, tough conversation to decide. Are we going to give it 30 more days, 60 more days, 90 more days? Or are we going to just say, hey, man, we gave it, we gave it our all. And we could never come back from what I did earlier. I'm sorry you're there, man. This is tough. It's tough, 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 tough. Um, my hope is, regardless of the baggage, the challenges, that any couple going through this situation can at least have enough dignity and respect for themselves and for the other, the other person that they're married to, to be honest and to sit straight across from each other eye to eye and say, what are we going to do now? I'm sorry, my brother. Let me know how that conversation goes, man, because uh, I'm rooting for you guys. We'll be right back. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey folks, all of us need a little guidance sometimes. In life, we're faced with tough situations and choices, and the way forward isn't always clear. I've been in that position. In fact, I'm in that position right now, and therapy is helping me find a path through it. Whether it's a career decision, relationship at a crossroads, or some other struggle you're facing, you need someone to talk with to move ahead with confidence. So if you've ever considered therapy, I recommend BetterHelp. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can walk with you on that journey to discover who you want to become. BetterHelp is entirely online, so it's convenient, flexible, and it fits your schedule, whatever your schedule may be. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Deloney today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Deloney. All right, let's go out to California and talk to the great and powerful Sharon. What's up, Sharon? Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> I can't believe that I get to talk to the Dr. Sharon John Deloney be- right now. Believe. Believe. I'm believing it. I'm embracing this moment Embrace it. right now. Dude, my kids won't even talk. You're Man, this makes me feel good. I may call you just randomly just so you can be that happy Absolutely. every time. Absolutely. Anytime. What's Keep up? my number close by. Well, Dr. John, I am ready and I am <laughs> sick. I can't even <laughs> wait to see what you're about to say. <laughs> I'm sick and tired of how much time I spend on my cell phone. No, you're not. I know. <laughs> you aren't. I want it. Okay. I feel like I want to be. Ah, there you go. Sick and tired yeah. of being on my cell phone. There you go. I love that. That's <sighs> huge. Okay, why do you spend so much time on your phone? It feels like an escape. It feels like this sense of rest. Like, I'll come home from a long day of work, and I'll be like, okay, it's time to take a nap, but it, I will choose to go on my cell phone instead and scroll to get some sort of relief from it. Do you have kids? No. Are you married? Nope. So it's just you, the couch, and the phone? Yep. Do you have cats, or, do you have cats or dogs? Um, my roommates have three scary old cats that I they, try to avoid. Do they call themselves cat parents? Um, yes. Oh, you got to move out of that house. It's not safe psychologically <laughs> for anybody. Oh, jeez. Um, can I just applaud you? Good for you. It's awesome. You. How old are you? I'm 20, 27. 27. All right. So if you could snap your fingers, you get home from work, what would you love to have happening as you get home from work? I'd love for the things in my head that I've wanted to do to to happen. Say them out loud. Get them out of your head and say them out loud. The things I want to do. If you could, if you, you had a picture of what your life would be like when you were 27, what was it? I'd like to... Uh, to paint, to read, to adventure, to get my laundry done in a good amount of time, to rest and prepare meals and eat well. All the things you are saying are ways that you love Sharon. 
So why don't you love Sharon that much? I think I, I don't know. I'm growing and loving Sharon. Awesome. Um, Here's the deal. I, I wish this, I could give you some, I've got some ideas on what to do. Okay. Okay. But I want you to begin to frame this as you're an addict. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Yes, you are a stone cold addict. And that's okay, because you know why? I am too. I did not have social media when I took this job. And now I even got a separate phone to have it on there. I told the, the place where I work, if you're going to make me have this like a tool, I need it on a separate phone. And... I find myself closing my door to my bedroom to be away from the chaos and I just start scrolling. And so I am announcing that I'm an addict too, Sharon. My name is John and I, I can't control my phone usage either. So we're in this together. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Sounds so, good. So do you have to have this like social media and all that stuff for your work? No, I don't. Okay. If you want to stop, you have to stop. That means you got to delete all that crap off your phone. And I want to say I have okay. deleted it. And what happens is I turn to like Etsy or I go on Venmo or I find some other way to scroll that even if it's not social media. Can you leave your computer, your laptop at work? And here's what I'm saying. Yeah. At some point, you have to put some hurdles in front of yourself and create some new habits. And it's kind of like if I'm telling somebody, hey, dude, the first thing you got to do before you dig into all your relationship issues and all that stuff, you got to quit drinking. You got to quit going to the bar. And they're like, yeah, but I'm just going to, like, you got to quit going to the bar. And yeah. for, for you, it's going to be um, not only just removing something, but you're going to have to add things back in. Now, you call you started the call by saying I am done with this. And then like you're like, well, I mean, I want to be done with this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you actually want to sit home and, and paint or do you want do you wish you were the kind of person that was like in a romantic comedy that came home and painted? No, I think I chose that as an alternative thing to do. What do you actually want to do? I want to, um, I don't know. There it is. You don't know. <laughs> and I think I you've got know. some ideas. Like, I want to be an adventurer and a painter. Dude, I've seen all those movies too, Sharon. But I don't think you want to be any of those things. Maybe you do. Yeah. But my guess is if you really wanted to, you would be doing those things. Yeah, that's true. Like, I really, really love playing my guitar. And so I'm always having my kids come downstairs saying, Dad, turn it down, please. You're not, like, you're not 15 again. And I'm like, I know, but I'm, one day they're going to call. They're never going to call. But, like, but I, I, it, it interrupts other things I'm doing because I like playing. Mm -hmm. What right. are those things for you? Or have you just created a life where you don't have other things? I guess it's a journey of, figuring out what those things are. <laughs> That's the most millennial thing you've said. I'm just on a journey. <laughs> I've got Taylor Swift in my headphones. I'm just on a journey. Here's what I would love to challenge you. I would love to challenge you for 30 days to delete them off and to sign up for two different classes. Whether that's a jujitsu class, whether that's a cooking class, a dance class, something. Two days a week after work, you have to go somewhere. I think there's there's been some talk and some discussion. Um, I haven't read the studies myself, but I've been the, the conversations have been compelling that our current generation of human, especially 35 and younger, spends an inordinate amount of time at home. Mm -hmm. Everybody's just at home all the time. And when you're at home all the time, A, there's no real romantic connections. There's no real friendship connections that happen. And the only thing you can do is scroll and play video games or watch Netflix. That's the only thing you can do because you're just at home. 
Mm-hmm. And so, and la- yesterday I was playing Uno with my daughter, and there's just only so many games you can play with Uno before I'm like, dude, I'm gonna set these cards all on fire in the front yard, right? There's only <laughs> so much of that, and so, um, I want to challenge you to be out of your house, but ma- but sign up for two classes for 30 days, and do two things that you're gonna be kind of uncomfortable doing. It's gonna be a little bit weird. And what you're going to do is if you do one athletic thing and one artistic thing and one this thing and one that thing, you're going to find out, dude, I am not a jujitsu person. Or you might find out I love, 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 love this. Or I am not a dance person or I'm not a whatever. So if I say a class like that, tell me something you'd be interested in. I'm imagining like a, uh, maybe like a ceramics or a watercolor I saw a ghost too, but I, I'm in, I'm in, whatever. It works. <laughs> My wife went and got her master gardener certification. She just wanted to learn about gardening. So she just like went to the ag extension building in our community and started, all it's to say is this, you can't just take something away. You got to fill it with something else. Okay. Okay. You also have to get radical about your commitment. Maybe call a house meeting and say, I'm committed to stopping scrolling. And every time y'all see me just sitting around scrolling on my phone, I have to put X amount of dollars in the jar. (laughs) I have no apps on my phone anymore, so you have to text me. You can't just DM me. Okay. And we're going to have a group of people over to the house once a week. Or I'm going to make dinner for everybody once a week. Uh, Whatever the thing is, but I want you to commit to doing signing up for two classes of two things. And do this. Let me know how it goes. I would love to know what classes you're going and then where what, what's happening on the back end. And that'll be your accountability. If you don't make it, I'm going to announce to all of America, there's not that many people listening to the show, but I'm going to tell all of them that you didn't make it. You just preferred to scroll your life away. But I don't think that's going to be you. I think you'll got it. I think you got it. I Here's my commitment to you. I'm going to commit for 30 days to leaving my... Whew, this going to be hard. I'm going to leave my work phone either at work or in my vehicle. I will not take it in my house. I have to get off of it. I have to stop. Um, It's like one of my core thing, teachings. And man, those guys who create those apps are good, man. They're good. They got me. So I know I've made commitments before and I've done them for a few weeks. I'm going to make 30-day commitment. Here we go. And so I want you to join me in this, Sharon. Um, I've got so much crap going on that I can assure you (laughs) I'll have plenty to do after work. But you got two things And when you catch yourself, which you will, that's okay. I want you to think out loud. Sharon is worth more than a numbed out life. Sharon is worth more than a life that we are just Netflixing away. Sharon is worth adventure, laughter, joy, athletic endeavors, whatever the things are. Sharon is worth a life well lived. Go make that happen. Get one of your roommates to go with you. I promise there's adventures on the other side of this thing that are going to be more valuable, more peaceful, more healthy than, oh my gosh, they're all coming to get us. Aliens are real. Bigfoot's not whatever. I don't know whatever you're scrolling. Let's put them away. Everybody listening, 30-day challenge. Put your phones away. Put them away. We'll be right back. All right, let's go out to Chattanooga, Tennessee, right down the road and talk to Maria. What's up, Maria? (laughs) Hi, thank you so much for taking my call. Of course. And I'm an incredible thank- singer, so thank you for letting me sing your name. What's up? You, you did great, um, <laughs> and thank you for your show. <laughs> you- Anytime somebody says, oh, you did great, that means you did terrible. <laughs> you did terrible. What's up? And uh, your show has helped me on and off for the last one and a half years, so major thanks um, for having a program like this. So I'm calling today um, because I'm struggling with balancing out I don't know. The reasons for making a decision to pause baby step two so that we can help our 14 year old who attempted suicide a year and a half ago um, find purpose, focus, and hope um, <clears throat> whilst also not putting our family at risk of, you know, remaining in, in this debt situation. So for people no. listening who don't understand her reference, mm-hmm. you guys, Maria, your family, y'all are paying off. You're trying to get out of debt. You're trying to pay all your debts off, right? Yes, sir. And then you have a 14-year-old girl who is really struggling. 
Yes. Yeah, she's doing well right now. Um, we've we've come a long way, and um, it was a, a quote unquote real suicide attempt. She um, ended up in ICU for three days, and then in a, uh, for a massive overdose of Tylenol, which would have killed her if she hadn't been on the phone with a friend who said you should call nine one one, and um, she then was admitted to this, I'll call it a stabilization facility that caused more damage than good. She was just a new 13-year-old, and they put her in there for 10 days, and we had no control over it. And she was with, you know, kids up to 17 years old who had drug and sexual and violent abuses and all this other thing. And so now what she's dealing with is just the trauma from that um, to help her move forward. But we have helped her. She did get the best um, dialectic behavioral therapy treatment. Mm-hmm. It was a, a full inpatient treatment for about six to eight weeks, and she meets with a therapist weekly. Um, What's her official and, diagnostic? Borderline? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no. Major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety, and she also developed tics mm-hmm. and She's not ADHD, but she has a focus problem. And we're also thinking there's a little bit of this lovely, uh, what is it called? Opposite, oppositional Uh, uh, defiance. Yeah. Yeah, It's uh, at some point they just start throwing everything up against a wall. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. I mean, it's just like, (laughs) I I want you guys to think, um, I want you guys to think outside of the diagnosis. Okay. Obviously, mm-hmm. she's seeing a professional, so let the professional do the professional things. Oh, yeah. um, what she needs at home is a stable, um, yeah, warm, peaceful home. Yep. Yep. Okay. And, and we, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, yes, that is something that we, uh, she does have a, she's not just, you know, the background. Uh, we are a very small, very close family. She's our only child. Um, and we do have um, her uncle lives with us. He is my brother. And he's a special needs adult. And uh, he's fully functioning. And so that that's the family unit. We don't have any other close relatives nearby. What was her story and as to... As to why? What led up to... Because yeah, yeah. That, that didn't happen in a vacuum we, for someone that young. N- that's right. Um, we haven't gotten a direct answer from her. The way that this whole thing started was that uh, beginning of uh, seventh grade, or towards the end of seventh grade, I guess, beginning of eighth grade, um, we got a call one day. Oh, sorry, sorry. So her behavior started changing. She started not talking with the friends we would normally hear her laughing and giggling with. And this was during COVID. Um, And she started wearing like darker clothing, which were like, okay, you're a teenager. You're going to try to find your look, your vibe, whatever, your group. Um, And she just seemed a little more moody and disconnected from us. And, you know, we would do our normal things, but we just chalked it up to hormones right, wrong, or indifferent. And one day, you know, we had an argument about what she was wearing. She just looked sloppy and slovenly. And it was just like, what is going on? Like, what is this kind of like, you got this death vibe look going on, you know, just it's, I know you, I emo, are you goth? Like, what is the deal? And um, we got into an argument about just how sloppy she was looking one day. And so she went to school that day. And then in the afternoon, I got the call from the school counselor that said, I have your daughter here and she's been cutting herself and um, you need to take care of this. And we were just mortified because this is the kid who has access to everything, anything she wants to do. Not that we've overindulged her, but like, for example, horses, she loves horses. We don't own a horse. We've never been around horses. We have paid for her to have the best lessons as often as she needs, et cetera. And so it just completely pulled the rug out from under us. We found a therapist and the therapist evaluated her on that first day. And then when she brought us in and she said, 
you guys, my husband and I, she's like, you guys are helicopter parenting this child and she needs some space. You're stifling her. And we said, okay, we're going to back off. Tell us what you want us to do. And she said, All right, hold on, I'm going to stop, stop right there. How did that feel mm-hmm. when they told you that? We were. Is that hard to hear? Mm-hmm. We didn't. We, I'm a parent. Hard to hear. I, I do, we disagreed with it because our daughter had been given a cell phone and she knew the rules. And we had told her for your protection, we are going to monitor randomly. I, and I told her, we don't have time. We have jobs. I don't want to look at your text. I don't, care. I don't look. I don't want to look at my own text. I don't want to look at it. All right, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm just gonna stop. I'm gonna stop right there. Even okay. that conversation right there, Maria, is too much for a 12 year old or a 13 year old. They can't. They can't cognitively process that conversation you and I were just having. Um, well, me, we took off the therapist had said take off the monitoring software. That was a and terrible, was- terrible, terrible advice. And that's what we followed her because she accused us of being these Hold on. super controlling parents. And we followed her damn advice. Sorry. No, that's, what it, that's what it later, was. And a month later, she overdosed. Yes, right? that, was, that was dreadful advice. And, it was awful. But it's not in a vacuum. And even the way you've painted the conversation about she got put in in, in inpatient when she tried, like, really tried to take her life. Mm-hmm. it's a madhouse in there. It's scary. Oh, it's awful. But hold on. But y'all aren't the victims of that. No. It's the best services that your community happened to have to take care of your baby girl and keep her alive. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. I've been in there more times than I can count be sitting with people. But to leave and go, well, they did all of this stuff to us and reframe this in a victim's light or this This, you got, I'm going to tell you right now, you got terrible advice. Here's what the advice should have been. No phones. Mm -hmm. A 13 year old who is trying to figure out who she is and is spinning out of control needs her parents to stop all the chaos, not Mm -hmm. to take the brakes off. Mm -hmm. What your kid desperately, desperately, desperately needs is her mom and her dad. Not, hey, we've got all this. We've got all this here. You can it's, you see what I'm saying? There's a difference there. And I'm not saying any of this we, is causal, okay? None of this caused this thing. But what I'm trying to give you is a path out, especially in, in concert with professionals. Um, and the phones... So, go ahead, go ahead. See, so the, just to be clear with the timeline, within... Three to four weeks after that, with her seeing this therapist a few times a week, um, that's when she attempted suicide. And I called the therapist, and she was just stunned. She was just like so apologetic. She just she said, "I didn't see it coming." And you know, my daughter was talking with her. So, so here here's here's the unfortunate place we find ourselves. Um, mm-hmm. We'll link to it in the show notes. There's a, a what I would call a masterpiece book by Dr. Gabor Mate and his uh, another child psychiatrist, um, and it's something along the lines of "Hold on to your kids." I think it's called. See if we can find that title of that book. Um, but it's co-written with somebody else. Here's here's okay. the premise of the book. You're going to hear from mental health professionals. You're going to hear from school officials. You're going to hear from everybody. Every YouTube, Yahoo News article or whatever telling you that the most important people in your kid's life when they become teens is their peers. And they need more unstructured interactive time with their peers. That's completely nonsense. That's not how their bodies are wired. Okay. Yes. Yep. We agree. And we've learned, learned that only the, in the most, the most horrible way. Um, And so we're in this state now where she is she's doing well we have better communication i won't say that it's perfect well no i got a 13 year old it's never perfect it's never perfect (laughs) yeah (laughs) right right and i you know we do have a good sense of humor in our family like you know i I will tell her if i mess up on something i'll say hey man cut me some slack i've I've, I've never done this before with a with a child you're my first you know so so (laughs) is there a possibility that you or your husband or both 
could alter your work schedules to where y'all could each have a morning breakfast once a week with her just alone? Oh, we do. Oh, just, my God. Just shooting no, the crap? We've, we've always done that. Yeah, we have game nights. We have movie nights. We, I've started giving her more of my time. Like, I will randomly, when I pick her up from school, I will do the unthinkable. I will show up with her favorite Starbucks drink, which I normally, because I'm on baby step two, I'm not buying that. So, you know, and, and we end up having just nice chats. We'll go for like a walk around and, you know, she, she has grown closer to us, but there are still, she's so traumatized per her therapist um, from that experience that there are certain things she is just terrified to talk about even with the therapist. Um, so we, we need to get to that ASAP. Yeah. And I've, um, she's working, I've shared that with the therapist okay. and Here's, we're going to have a family session with yes, her as well. Good. So we, and we do, we do those periodically. Okay. And so my, my concern like, on that kind of move is, and again, I'm, I am mm-hmm. completely throwing spaghetti up against a wall here, okay? Okay. But a kid who can't verbalize what's happening, sometimes that means it's still happening. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that means it is so close, I don't have words for it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, and again, um, it can be anything from bullying at school that is so profound that just isn't fully understood it can be you have another adult male living in your house. It can be any number of things. A combination of things too, right? In, in, in anything. But mm-hmm. getting to that where your daughter feels safe enough to start begin, begin to start talking about some of this stuff. Let me go back to the beginning question here. <sighs> your child's... Mental health and mental well-being is more important than getting out of debt. Your child being alive is more important than that goal right now. I'm not suggesting you go borrow a bunch of money. I don't think you need to do that. But, but yes, your kid's health comes first. Does that mean you go buy a horse? No. That doesn't mean you go buy a horse. It does mean that your kid gets a job and begins to help out with horse lessons or dance lessons or whatever things y'all going to do. That does mean, like in this one phone call, if you go back and listen to it, the victim of this, a victim of this, and now we're a victim of a, of a 13-year-old kid. At some point, I want you, Marie, to take ownership and your husband to take ownership of this house. I, I, we are going to be the most important people in the lives to our daughter. And we're not going to do that through force feeding. We're going to do that through connection. And man, there's all kinds of mess going on. And there's a, there is a spike in suicide. The last numbers I saw, um, it's been a minute since I looked at them, but it's, there is a spike and there is a lost sea of middle school kids, like a lost generation of kids who the last few years of their elementary school was in COVID lockdown. And it's a mess. I've got a middle schooler. I get it. I talk to middle school kids all the time. It's a mess. But I'm not going to attach all that mess to my kid. And if I got to pull my kid out of a school, I'm going to pull my kid out of a school and I'm not going to give my kid a smartphone. I'm not going to give my kid unfettered access to bullies 24, seven, 365. And that hurts my child. I know that or it doesn't hurt them. It, it makes them uncomfortable. It makes them a pariah. It makes them an outsider. I get that. But the data is too clear for me and I'm not going to blame and I'm not going to blame. And I'm not going to blame. I want you to start thinking about things that aren't going to be random that might be very, very structured because it sounds like what this baby girl could use a healthy dose of is some significant structure. On Mondays, we do this and on Tuesdays, we do this and on Wednesdays, we do this and it's going to be a practice, a practicing of structure. I think that might be good for the whole family. Obviously, 100% continue on with the, um, with the, with your counselor, with your therapist. And for every therapist listening, for God's sake, it is never the right move for a 12 or 13 or 14-year-old 
for you to tell their parents, actually, we need you to back off even more and let them have unfettered access. You are overbearing checking on their phones. That's insane. Absolutely insane. I'm not giving my kids access to the open internet and all the predators and all the nonsense and all. I just had a call a minute ago about how I can't control myself. How am I going to expect my child to? No, no, thank you. No, thank you. Maria, continue to plug in your kid, man. Continue to plug in and don't break the bank buying things. Obviously pay for rehab and things like that if she needs to go get go get professional help. But um, let's sit down and take a global look at your daughter's health, her mental health, and all the things, all, all that we need to do there. And let's make sure the whole family's plugged in because, there's man, something's not right. Something's not sitting right with me. And hopefully the therapist can dig that out. Thanks for the call. We'll be right back. Hey, what's up? Dr. John Deloney here. Check it out. My new book, Building a Non-Anxious Life, is now available for pre-order. Here's the great news. Anxiety is not the enemy we've been led to believe. I know this because I've walked alongside countless folks over the last two decades, and I've struggled with this too. If you create a life of intentionally living out the six daily choices I've outlined in this book, you're going to be able to better respond to whatever life throws at you. You're going to learn the choices you can make day by day to create a more peaceful, joyful, less chronically stressed, non-anxious life. Plus, when you pre-order my book, I want to give you something to help you today. That's why you'll instantly get my newest talk, Smoke, Fire, and Freedom, that I gave to several thousand folks a few months ago, where I break down the misunderstandings and myths we believe about anxiety, how to reclaim your freedom, and how to build a non-anxious life. So pre-order Building a Non-Anxious Life today for just 20 bucks at johndeloney.com. All right, as we wrap up today's show, I never thought I would have Shine Down on this show, but here we are. Kelly's third favorite band behind Tupac and Beyonce. The song's called The Symptom of Being Human. I can still remember me and Miss November Rain, beautiful and strange, always so inclined, coloring outside the lines. Yeah, you are never on time. Hey, me neither. You're always been slightly awkward. Yes, kind of weird. Is this talking about me, Kelly? This is hurting my feelings. Upside down and not all here. Yes. What's wrong with me and you is crystal clear. Unpack all your baggage, hide it in the attic where you hope it disappears. This all seems so familiar, but it doesn't feel like home. It's just another unknown. Kelly, the Shinedown fan. Love you guys. Stay in school. Bye.